welcome everybody. Thanks again for joining. I'm just going to do a brief introduction of myself. My name is Natalia Valenzuela. I'm a geology consultant with Datamine. I focus in our exploration products, which of course includes Discover, Fusion, which is our database management system, and B Explorer. A bit about myself. I'm a geoscientist by trade. I have a network curiosity for exploration, um, GIS, data management, and of course, rocks. I have my rock collection here next to me. And today I'm going to talk you through or walk you through master and grid grading, which is from point data to maps. And today we're going to cover the basics. We are not going to go very advanced mainly because of time, but please let me know if you'll be interested in having a second session where we go through more advanced things like grading LiDAR data and stuff. And I'm just going to go very back to basic and speak about working with data. So probably most of you are familiar that Map Info Discover has two main types of data. One is vector files, or what we call the Map Info tables, and this can be point, line, objects, regions, or text. The second type of data will be the raster data, which can be raster image or grid image. The main difference is that a raster image is composed by square elements called pixels, and each pixel will have an RGB color value associated with it. Now, if the raster image contains information about the real world, or in other words, if it's georeference, you can just display it in Map Info, and Map Info will know what's the location in the real world. Alternative, you can use Map Info to georeference image. And if you're not sure how to do this, please reach out and I will teach you later how to do this. The second type of raster will be a grid image or a raster grid, which is um, another type that can be opened by Discover and is the one that we're going to be focused on today. Raster grids appear the same as a raster image, but these ones are directly related to a grid, grid file, which is a multi-resolution raster or MRV. You're going to see a lot through this webinar that MRR is the multi-resolution raster format for, from Discover, Discover Map Info. Um, now you can also open other um, raster files like ERS, which is the ER mapper, and surfer grids and some other types. I'm going to show you how to open different uh, grid formats. The grid can store color and information such as geochemical data, elevation, which is the most common one, and geophysical uh, measurements. General, the values are referred as set. This is mostly speaking about topography or elevation, but again, it can be any numerical data. Now, a raster grid can have multiple values or attributes per cell. Per cell. These are referred as bands. These grids will be then referred as multi-banded grid. Okay. If we keep going, I have a first exercise. I pre-record these exercises just mainly to keep myself accountable for time. So uh, please feel free to follow. Now, what I'm going to do is I will send you um, a link probably later so you can download the grids that I'm using for this first exercise. This first exercise is um, just using data from the mirrors to open grids. We are not going to do a lot of processing. It's just mainly showing you how to open them. So I'm going to go through this, and then we're going to keep going with a bit more theory of grading. OK, I'm going to start by opening ECW by changing the file type to raster. This will give me the visibility of all the raster files that I have within this folder. I'm going to pick the elevation, and I'm going to repeat the same process to And I'm going to repeat the same process to open my blue year geophysical data. So I'm going to go open table, file type, I'm going to change it to raster, and I'm going to pick the blue year layer. Now, once I'm happy with this map, we are going to clip the raster just to show you how you do that. And to do that, I'm just going to focus on that southeastern part where I have that uh, subtle anomaly, higher anomaly. To do that, I'm going to use a cosmetic layer and I'm going to go to spatial insert polygon and I'm just going to draw a polygon. Remember that you can use a cosmetic layer as a trace paper to draw temporary objects on your maps. Because it's temporary, if I want to create a table, I need to go to map, say cosmetic objects, 
I'm just going to call it anomaly underscore target. Now, once I'm happy with that, I can untick the make the layer editable and I'm going to proceed to my raster ribbon and raster operations and clip. And for input file, I'm going to start with the elevation. I want to return everything that is inside. And the clip region is going to be the polygon. And I'm just going to click process. I am going to repeat that same process with the Bouger. And I'm going to click process. Now let's just have a look at the results. I'm going to take and take some of these layers. Uh, that looks OK. I'm happy with that. So now we can proceed to the next exercise. I'm just going to close everything. And in this next exercise, I'm going to show you how to open ERS uh, raster files. So let's go to close all these. Now we go open table and I'm going to look for my ER mapper files. Again, change the file type to raster. And in this case, let's just open straight every year because we are going to do some geophysical filtering, which is the first option at the top. OK, because it's a raster compatible layer, which we can tell by that rainbow symbol next to the layer name, I have all the raster options available, including the analysis options, which is uh, things, for example, your physical filtering. So I'm going to apply one geophysical filtering, in this case, a one BD, just to show you the capabilities. I'm not going to focus much on this part for today, but if you're interested in a deeping dive into this topic, please let me know. I can do a follow up webinar. I'm just saving this as one video underscore webinar. And one thing to notice once I'm finished processing this is that the icon next to the product of this process is going to have this heat map symbol, which means the surface in this sense. So none of the raster options are available. If I want to make those raster options available, I need to go to surfaces and then click grid toggle which is going to convert the surface into a raster compatible layer. And as you notice, the symbol changed back to a rainbow. Now I'm just cleaning my windows around. And because it's a raster compatible layer, I can do a couple of things, as mentioned before. For example, if I go to raster, I can do a color stretch or I can do some advanced color experiments in this sense. One of the things to notice is that you get your data distribution, which is really useful. And those pink bars at the end are your boundaries. And if I click apply clip limits and transparent clip limits, everything that is outside those boundaries that I can move by clicking and dragging is going to be transparent. This is useful for targeting a higher values, anomalies with higher values, or if, for example, in elevation, if you know your elevation is related to your bedrock, you can also just flip around those topographic highs. You can also change the bean count and again, just general in general to analyze your data. Another thing that you can do is you can change to RGB display mode and you can change the color table. Let's make it grayscale scale in this case. I'm just going to close this and that's it for this exercise. Let's move into the next one. So that's mainly how you open. Um, grids are already created. But um, if we want to create a grid, which is what we are all here for, the, we have a different uh, type of options and different methods to create grids. So uh, let's speak about those. OK. Essentially, for those of you who are not familiar, a grid is um, bunch of squares that are taking value from your points and deciding what's the best value for uh, that specific pixel or square within your raster grid. 
survey grid creation do not really assign the input data point value into the grid match. This is called the stamping. Rather, what we do is an interpolation that is calculated at each center from the surrounding input to data. Okay. And we can create surface grid from various data sources, such as satellite imaginary, LIDAR, as I mentioned, point data or point cloud data. Now, um, we're going to start by speaking about triangulation or triangulation grading method. For triangulation, the input data points are joined by lines called um, where, where we create triangles based on the closest distance. Then these triangles are then used for to create a triangulated surface, which are those lines in blue. And the intersection of the triangulated surfaces and the grid cell centers, so wherever that triangle meets the grid of the background, is where it will determine the grid values. So the grid or the cell grid is not going to have the value of the star, which are your points, neither the value of one specific triangle is going to consider all the intersections of the triangle and come with a best value. A common means conception is that if the data point falls in the grid cell, uh, then the value will be honored, and this is only true if the cell center of the input data coincide. This is just a bit of the theory. Um, we don't really have, when we're working with Discover, you don't really need to be that concerned about what is the software doing on the background. It's also, of course, good to understand, but the software is doing that for you. What we need to be mindful of is the grid or the grid uh, size or the distance between your points, because that's one of the, what is going to determine the resolution. So for, grid, for grading with triangulation, uh, we have one first exercise. Please get your uh, download spot data ready, because you're going to be using that for this one. OK, so once we have an understanding of what is a, what is the triangulation method, Let's create a digital elevation model using that methodology. So I'm going to go to raster, and I'm going to use the option open within my raster ribbon. Um, just remember that, probably have heard before, that discover map info will give you the option to open tables in each of the ribbons. Say home, table, map, discover an image. They all have an open table option, and they all do the same, so don't worry or stress too much about that. Just use the one that you feel more comfortable with or the one that is closer. In this case, I'm going to go to open. And I'm going to click download spot, which is one of the files I'll send you. This is a map info table. I'm going to go open. And as you notice, it's a perfectly spaced a point cloud data. And the reason why I mentioned perfectly spaced is because I understand that when you're dealing with real data, this is training data. It's not going to be this perfect and this beautiful. So just be mindful and before working with, start working with that and creating a raster grids, just get an understanding of the values within your table and the sp spatial distribution because the space between points is important for, it's very important for creating grids. So I'm going to go to create raster within my raster ribbon within the section interpolate and I'm going to select triangulation method. Now I'm going to select my input file, which is going to be download spot. Make sure you tick that small box, otherwise it doesn't recognize it. And then for select color, HHD underscore RL. And now I'm going to go OK. Now we are not going to move anything here, but just so you know, if we go to data condition and options, we have the option to specify invalid data. For example, you have negative values that you know they are not real, convert null to background, or cap to maximum and minimum. You also have the option here to clip to region, which is really useful if you're working with really big data sets. Also, a uh, fun fact or more than advice, if you are getting to discover mobile, I recommend uh, clipping always your DTM and rasters just to your area of interest that makes the project lighter. I'm going to click OK. And for select method, I'm going to keep it as a triangulation. I want to interpolate all the edges for this case. For parameter unit, I'm going to leave it as cells. The method options set parameters for the triangles created during the data interpolation and recreation. 
When creating the triangles for interpolation, the maximum cells will be automatically determined. If, this, if, the, option, if the distant option is selected, the triangle size will be then determined from a distant unit rather than a cell count. So in this case, we want it to be cells, and the moment I set it as cells, it's going to give me the 100 value, which I'm going to accept it. Now I'm going to give to, I'm going to move to raster geometry and in cell size, I'm going to go suggest. And it's going to take a while to think about it because it's reading all my points. But essentially, while this um, gets processed, I'm going to explain you what it's doing. It's going to measure all the all your data, all the distance between your sampling points or your data, and it's going to calculate a value that the system considers accurate or proper for your data set, and this value will be somewhere between half and a quarter of the, of the separation between your points. So once I'm happy with the value that um, it suggests, I'm just going to go and accept the output file name by default. You are more than welcome to change it if you want, and also if I can click output settings, you can change the compression settings. And if I click here, I can change the location. But more than that, I can save it as a different uh, file type. I'm just going to click cancel and I'm going to go process. And now if I zoom out, there we have. We have our digital elevation model. That thing that you see in the middle is a leg, so that's real for these data sets is not an artifact. Now I'm just going to go to my Explorer window and I'm going to untick the visibility of the download spot so we can get a better overview of our beautiful grid. Now I'm going to close interpolation and I'm just going to show you a couple of things. If I go to my raster ribbon, I have heel shade options so I can change the direction of the shade. I can also change the sun elevation. which is really cool. And again, you can do color stretches in the uh, same as you will do with any raster that you're importing, as we saw with the geophysical data. I can change it to linear and change it to the standard deviation to ranges. Um, but normally, I will just go as Instagram for elevation. So I'm going to leave it as it is. Another thing that I want to show you is what I'm going to do is I'm going to click draw profile and you're going to notice that the Microsoft changed to a cross. And now I'm going to click at the top or the north part of my digital elevation model. I'm going to drag it and I'm going to double click at the bottom. And what it's going to do is going to generate a cross section of the elevation model, being the series where I start drawing, which is at the top, and the end point is at the bottom. And now if I go here and I change this none to download spot, it's giving me at zero, zero meters, which is the top, you have this value for elevation and these are your coordinates. So that's also useful for um, just interrogating your data in terms of topography profile. Plus, if you ponder around this, you will also give you a, that profile what's the distance and the specific value. And you can export this in case you need it. OK, now let's close this one and we're going to proceed to creating contours. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to raster operations and I'm going to click contour. And I'm going to select my input file is going to be download spot. A H D underscore RL, which is the one we create or our raster grid, in other words. And our input file is going to be our digital elevation model, which is this, this file here. And then for contour type, I'm going to select polyline. You can also select regions, um, but I will just say go polyline because you want the contour. Then for a method, uh, I normally go to fixed intervals, unless you're really picky with your intervals. And it's actually giving you here the intervals which you can come and change if you um, have a bit of obviously with not having run numbers, you can come and change it here. 
Now, um, don't stress too much about the resolution level. For um, it doesn't create really create an impact. Sorry, that's what I meant. For match colors to impact to input, I normally just tick it because it's gonna just adopt the color from the background. And again, the output file you can change the settings if you want. Otherwise, just go process. Is thinking. And once it's done, I'm going to go to Explorer. Just going to get rid of the profiling by right clicking and clicking here. Okay, now if I go to my Explorer, and I make the Darlot spot digital elevation model invisible. Now I can see my contours. Okay, um, a couple of other things we can do. If I go to this surface edge, sorry, the ribbon, and I go to contours and I go to contour labels, I can select this table, which is a the table that has my contours or my polylines, which are the contours. And the column is going to be the label. And I can change the styling for the uh, labels. And the label distance as well, if you want. And the maximum labels. In this case, we are going to create a new table for our labels. And I'm going to call this label underscore contours and just click save and OK and there we have. Now what we're going to do now is I'm going to add a point layer which is a sampling point uh, where the elevation is missing and I'm going to use that DTM that we create to get those elevation values. So in other words, I'm going to interrogate my ETM, DTM to get those uh, values. A similar concept can be applied to grid hole planning. Like if you have plan colors and you need the coordinates, you can use a raster file to get those coordinate values um, for rasters. And you can also do that for vector files. You don't have this point layer that I'm going to use for this exercise. Apologies for that. I I honestly forgot to send it. So please just follow my steps and this will be recorded so you can do it on your own time. If you would like to practice and you need that later, just let me know, I'll send it to you. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to home, open table. I'm going to look for this uh, layer called major elements and I'm going to close that and let's have a quick look at this one. And the RL is empty, as we can see. It has a value of zero. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to go back here. I'm going to go to raster, raster operations, point inspect. I'm going to select the input file, which is my DTM. Now uh, my point layer is going to be major elements. I want to edit the existing table. And the column that I'm going to update is RL. And I'm just going to click process. And now, if I close this, my RL has been populated with the values from my DTM. As quick and simple as that. Now, that's everything for this exercise. Let's keep it moving. Okay, now we are going to move into a different method, which is going to be Natural Neighbor. Natural Neighbor is um, essentially, it's a method to estimate values at unknown locations, which are given data set based on neighbor sample points. So in my own words, I will say it like when you have just data all over the shop and you don't really know the fixed distance between one to other points. The principle behind this is to assign values to an unknown point by considering the influence of its neighbor. Instead of creating an explicit list of surface, it calculates a weighted average of the values from all the data around it.
Now, another method that I commonly use is the inverse distance weighted or ITW. Uh, I use this mainly for geochem data because it gives a weight to each sample depending on how far it is from the search point. The X on the screen is what I will call the search point and A, B, C and D are your samples. So again, depending how far they are is the weight that you're going to get. Um, it assumes that things are close to one another are more likely to um, have an impact at those further apart. The measured values closest to the prediction location have more influence, and also it seems that each measure point has a local influence that diminishes with distance. Now, um, to create a grid with this methodology, we need to understand the concept of the search ellipsoid. And the concept of the search ellipsoid is that you X, as we as I mentioned, is where you're going to start your search and you can search around in a circle or you can search on an ellipsoid. Again, I normally go with ellipsoid because uh, in geology or in geophysics, we are normally target in targeting anomalies uh, and these anomalies or targets in general. These targets or anomaly will normally have a strike, uh, which will be our major axis. In this case, for example, the uh, major axis is 140 and a minor axis, which in this case will be um, between the sampling points. And the concept of the ellipsoid, as I mentioned, it's a major and a minor, minor axis. Uh, for this exercise, our major axis is going to be the distance between our sampling lines, and the minor axis will be the distance between our um, points. So the separation between those points. This can change depending on your grid, on your data, on your target, on your anomaly. The important thing to consider when you are uh, defining the parameters for the search ellipsoid is first, the major and minor axis needs to be at least big enough to cover the separation between either your lines or your points, depending which are you speaking about. Uh, how far you go is up to you and your data, how much it varies with distance. And you always want to follow the strike of your grid. Because sometimes, in some uh, specific cases, the target or the anomaly won't fit the grid strike. So in this case, the grid is, going to, is what is going to define your search ellipsoid. So we're going to do one exercise using both methodologies. Um, and we're going to see what result we get from that. Please get ready your data from ISAStream Geochem. OK, so this is our last exercise. This exercise will have two main components. The first one is more like a demo cell. So please just um, pay attention. And if you have any questions, let me know at the end. The second part, uh, you have the data set. That's the ISAStream Geochem. So please get that ready and follow my clicks. If you have any questions, again, at the end, well, I'm more than happy to go through it. So let's get started. I'm going to go to home, open table, and I'm going to look first for one layer called copper hill salts. And it's essentially a cloud of points, or in this case, is a grid for sampling. Now I'm going to open another one layer just as a reference, copper hill grand mag. And if I turn off the points, we can see that there is a magnetic glow anomaly in the middle, which is what my grid sampling is targeting. That's what the highest concentration of points is there. Now, if I open the copper hill salts table, this one already has the results of my elements from my soil sampling. And what I want to do first is to get an idea of what's the distribution of my data. And if I'm working with Geochem data, the first thing that I will do is go to analysis and look at data statistics which is a really useful and powerful tool from this cover mapping. And just to give you a quick run through this tool, uh, just select your table, which in this case is copper hill cells, and you can get all these uh, statistics. I'm going to go with the basic one, which is just mean, max, mean, sum, etc. And I'm going to pick copper, um, lead, silver, and zinc. And one thing or a couple of things to notice is that first, you also have the data handling option similar to the one we saw for our triangulation, where you can set conditions for your data, like, for example, ignore negative values. And another really useful tool is that 
you can group. So let's say if I want to see what is the mean of copper by lithology girl group, I can go here and select geology or lithology, whatever is the case. I'm not going to do that and I'm just going to accept the output table. I'm just going to go OK. And what it's giving me, if I close this one, is the stats per commodity. Now, one thing I notice here is that the minimum value for copper is minus 999, which is not right. So I just want to be mindful of that. I have a couple options. Of course, I can go and correct that and do a QQC, but because I just want to do this very quickly, I'm just going to keep that in mind when I'm handling my option for migrating. So I'm going to close these ones. I don't need them anymore. I'm going to go back to my map window and I'm going to go to raster create raster and in this case we're going to use inverse distance weighting because as we just learned and because we're working with a geochem data that is not especially distributed equally all across my grid and we want to get a way to each sample depending on the distance right so we're going to go to select files and i'm going to go copper hill soils and we're going to be working with copper so I'm going to go to copper and just click OK. OK, now, as we remember for our statistics, we have those, that minus 999 value. So what I want to do is to tell the system that I wanted to ignore it. So I'm going to go to filtering and I'm going to go specify invalid data and I'm going to type minus 999. And then I'm also going to go to check the convert node to background. I don't need to clip, so that's okay. I'm just gonna click OK. Now, for parameter unit, I wanna change this to distance because distance here is what is gonna rule the weight of the sampling. And it's up to you if you wanna work with meters and or meters or kilometers. In this case, meters is here for me. And I know that, let me just bring my, my presentation. I know that the space between my grid lines is going to be 120 and the space between my sampling points is 30 meters. And I call this, the space between the grid lines, the major axis because that's the direction where this, in this case, the anomaly and my grid, uh, my sampling grid is striking, which is 140. So my major axis is 140. Sorry, my major axis is in this direction and it's striking to 140. And this is what I will call the minor axis. And I know that at least the spacing needs to be um, 120 for the major and 30 for the minor. With that in mind, I'm gonna go back to discover and I'm gonna search, sorry, I'm gonna change the search modes, mode to elliptical and as I mentioned, the major axis should be at least 120, so I'm going to make this 150. For the minor axis, I want to take at least three samples per se, so I'm going to make it one, 100. And as I mentioned, the orientation is going to be 140. Mm, I don't want to take apply sector support. Now for cell size, I'm going to let the system in this case suggest me the best which as a rule of thumb is going to be a um, half of a quarter of the distance between points. Now I just keep a view of the processing time to make the most of everybody's time and here's what I have got. This one that the one that says copper heel so that's the result of the grading. If I turn off turn off the soil sampling we can see that this is how far the ellipsoids are searching. Now that looks a bit rustic. I want to make this more like a nice, beautiful and soft or smooth surface. And luckily we have one option for that or more than one option. If I go to raster and raster operations and I go to filter, um, here we have a couple of options. I can do an enhancement, I can do a smoothie or I can do custom filters. 
first I'm going to change the input file which is going to be copper heel soles for copper and I'm going to go for smoothing and the picker I call the smoother is going to be so I'm just going to go by 7 by 7 and see how that looks and just apply process and that's an example if I go to 3 by 3 this is how it will look okay and that's about it now we're going to proceed into the second exercise which is going to be using natural mm, natural neighbor so i'm going to go to home and close and, and close all and what i'm going to do now is i'm going to also close this one we don't need it i'm going to go to home open table and I'm going to open, in this case, I said string key, okay. Now, in this sense, it's not as easy to use inverse list and weighted because there's no one trend that my sampling points are following, at least not from my perspective. So what I'm going to do in this case, I'm going to go a bit more simple and I'm going to use natural labor. So if I go to create raster, if I go to raster, create raster, natural neighbor, I'm gonna follow the same process that we have been following, select the file, ice stream geochem. Again, I'm gonna go with copper and I'm gonna go okay, so here. I'm gonna go okay in this case. I don't have any any negative values, so I don't need to do any data handling. For um select method, I'm gonna go natural neighbor. Parameter journal, I'm going to go sales and I'm going to go distance. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick measurement between my points just to get an idea of how far they are. So it right click, get the ruler, and I can tell, okay, the distance between this one is 11 kilometers. If I go 11 kilometers for my search radius, it's going to give me something very crazy. So I'm just going to make peace with the fact that I'm going to have blank spaces. Now let's see how far these points are. This is 1.24, so around one kilometer sounds reasonable. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to change this distance to kilometers and I'm going to make this one kilometer and now I'm going to let the software suggest me the cell size. Just be mindful with the cell suggestion while this process that it's a good starting point, but it's still good practice to do not just take what the software is offering you, because often might give you a very uh, like a very big uh, cell size, which will compromise your resolution. And of course, you don't want to go too small because then the processing time gets too big. Now I'm going to click process. I'm going to go back to my explorer and I'm going to turn off my points and that's my end result. Again, I can apply filters. We're going to raster and I'm going to apply the smoothing just to make it look a bit nicer. That's it. Now I'm just going to quickly mention that if I go to surfaces, there is one tool, tool or photon con interactive getting. Probably most of you uh, have used this one before, and it's essentially it's most of these same functionalities. But the difference is that it allows you to have a preview of your data. Um, because it's dynamic, it's very intense of getting the previews, but it also has less options so I didn't cover this one because most of you probably are know it, but just so you know, this is another way of doing grids. And it just works with one parameter at a time. While most of the methods we saw can take more than one parameter, for example, you can use it for to process lighter data, which is a completely different topic, and we can speak about that another time. Now, I think that's it. 
I will open the floor for questions now and hopefully you find this very productive. Thank you.